Hello, everyone. So I'm Esther. I'm a web developer at Torchbox. Uh, and Torchbox, for those who don't know, is a digital agency creating web application and uh, uh, website, digital marketing strategy. And we also create a cool thing, chain uh, for Django, uh, call it Wagtail. And um, yeah, I'm also one of the organizers of Pack in Italia and one of the Strawberry Graphical Code. Oh, yeah, I should mention that we are hiring Python developers uh, uh, worldwide and in Brazil, and we have also other positions open, so check online if you are looking. Um, yeah, today I want to tell you a little story. So I was in Florence last year uh, and with a, a friend, one of my friends, Sabrina, and we went to a bookshop. And uh, she suggested me a very interesting reading, uh, Invisible Woman Exposing a Bias in a World Designed for Men, by, written by Caroline Perrins. A very good reading, in my opinion. But uh, this talk basically talk about Gender by how gender bias affect the, in the use of data in our society, healthcare, education, employment, etc. So yeah, spoiler: we still have a little bit to do to fix gender gap. But today I don't want to talk about uh, the book itself, but just about a particular chapter, chapter four, that talks about the tech industry. So our industry. And I was particularly surprised uh, and shocked to know that during the 40 and the 50, women, not men, were the dominant sex in programming. So the opposite of what we had today. And of course, like many of you, I think, I, I already see the picture on uh, books and uh, with all these women working on computer, a lot of cables, black and white. But I never truly realized how many of them, so they, they, they were the majority. So much, there were, there were pictures uh, in magazines like Cosmopolitan uh, to encourage a woman to apply for jobs. So a typically more feminine magazine. So my question was, how that is possible? How do we get to, from that situation to, to what we have today, that we are struggling so much to fix gender gap uh, and increasing women participation in, uh, in tech? So first, we have to think about the historical regions, reasons. So during the Second World, uh, men were called to arm, and many women work in technical roles, including operating some uh, early computers like ENIAC in uh, the uh, US and Colossus in the UK. Those experiences paved the way for women to continue to work in uh, technical roles also after the war. And the second uh, reason is that the perception of programming was different. In the early days of computer, programming was um, thought to be like more uh, a woman thing because, and was less prestigious than the hardware engineering because uh, hardware engineering was considered only a heavily dominated male field. But programming was conceived more like a clerical work, so typing, filling, that were traditionally more female dominated roles. So this perception made it acceptable for the society to, to for women to work in technical field and continue. So there was already a gender gap uh, that led to underestimate the women's works. And the term programming was not yet mainstream, so there were many assumptions around it, well, about what it meant. And in fact, Ruth Lichterman, one of the girls that worked at ENIAC, in an interview was trying to clarify it. And basically here, the interviewing is assuming that programming will just rearrange the cables. And actually, Ruth stopped him and started to say, no, it's actually more than that. 
is about taking pen and paper, start to do diagrams, uh, and when, there was, when the software were big, there were women specify in only a part, a portion of the software, and only after all these steps, then uh, start to program me, or in this case, plug in, in the cables. So that sounds a bit familiar to me, but I don't know why. So we have to consider that there were no programming languages, no operating system at the time, no best practicing guidelines, textbooks. So forget solving principle, forget design patterns. Every programming technique must be evaluated and worked out for, for the first time. And these women at ENIAC made a lot of innovation, in, in fact, uh, and inventions on uh, programming techniques like Betty Hoberton invented a special technique that involved stop the machine in the middle of the program and look for the partial result. So yeah, when the next time you are debugging or you're struggling, think about her and say thank you, Betty. <laughs> um, yeah, to continue our story. So, the computer became commercial uh, at the end of the 50, and companies like IBM started to sell them massively. And companies uh, with their brand new computer need programmers to start building their the custom software. And good programmers were hard to find because nobody knows how to program yet. So this is when the first software crisis was declared. And um, Companies and industries start to use some uh, aptitude test and personality profile to ev evaluate the candidates, so the potential programmers, because nobody knows how to program yet. So there was a brand new team thing, and the company has to evaluate the potential good employees and then train them. So it was a huge, huge investment. So they start to look at those skills that they thought that was, they, they would have lead to be successful in programming. So the underlying assumption is that there were some innate qualities that will be correlated with good programming performance. So this test aimed to evaluate a specific skill like uh, verbal meaning, uh, reasoning um, and emotional stability. The test usually involved uh, identify synonyms, uh, um, completing number series, uh, answering questions uh, related to personality traits, uh, or a mix of uh, mathematical trivia, logic puzzle, and war games. So they were already widely criticized. Uh, study proved that there were no significant correlation between the test scores and uh, the subsequent job performance. And they were already widely criticized. They start to make jokes of them. Um, but here is the important thing is some beliefs came out from this personality profile. Some weird things like, uh, their belief of a relationship between programming and musical ability. Why not? Um, so, and other stuff like for most of the time, programmers enjoy their work, dislike routine, and they were in particular interested in problem solving, and they disinterest in people. Programmers dislike activities involving close personal interaction. They prefer work on things rather than with people. So these personality profiles formalize the stereotype that we all know. A male, typically wearing a hoodie, always wearing a hoodie, they spend all this time behind a computer, which may not uh, leave much time for socializing. So unfortunately, these stereotypes has discouraged women from pursuing programmer careers and because they feel they must be obsessed with the computers and work on with them all the time to be, su to be successful in programming. So as a result, from the 90s, the 
women participation in tech start to decrease, both in occupation and uh, in computer science. Moreover, males were more likely to have a computer at home because maybe someone gives them and they play with it and they look more confident with it and skilled. And this was reinforcing the stereotype that women were less capable of programming. So this stereotype and bias continue to affect the tech industry today and uh, lead the lack of diversity and inclusion in the tech theme. So addressing those biases is, is important. It's important to interrupt them and uh, take ac action to build a more inclusive and uh, uh, diverse industry. There are several factors that contribute to gender bias. One is unconscious bias. So from when we are young, we get our culturally based mental models for objects, system, people around the world. These schemas help us to navigate the world, but sometimes they lead to unconscious bias, causing us to miss some strengths and characteristics uh, uh, in people that don't fit for our mental image of a good leader or a good technical person looks like. Implicit bias are natural of the human psychology, and we all have in some degrees. The important is to recognize them and start to interrupt them. Gender biases. For example, uh, a, wo a woman may be characterized as too aggressive, while the same behavior is as socially acceptable for a man, and sometimes even encouraged. This bias influences promotion and hiring the decision, so resulting disparity in compensation is estimated that globally women are paid 20% less compared to males, and this data is even worse if we consider people of color. This means that women work for free two, year, two months a year. So, Gender bias can create a hostile work environment, make it difficult for women to continue in their careers and make it this problem even worse. Um, another thing, so we have to consider the, the platform, the software that we use, because some years ago was found out that LinkedIn was suggesting more male candidates uh, than female candidates. And they later hired a diversity team that should have uh, fixed uh, this problem uh, some degrees, but the algorithms still have some kind of bias in their functions. And these platforms are not open source, so we don't know how the algorithm, how they are coded, uh, and we rely on, on independent studies. Um, Moreover, uh, recently there was, with all the layoff going on in the industry, that can be, I hope not, of course, that this diversity team may be reduced and the consequences will know only when it's too late. I hope not. Uh, now let's see the, how meritocratic system can ironically perpetuate gender bias uh, and in the, in the industry was found out by a study that when companies emphasize meritocracy in their core values, men were often more higher bonuses than women uh, with equivalent performance. Um, this is because meritocratic system devaluation of the performance is often based on personal judgment and assumption that can be influenced by gender biases. So this study highlights the importance of being aware of the consequences of meritocracy and the need to establish a truly and fair objective evaluation of the performance and promotion. And companies should reflect very well on their core values because they aren't just slogan uh, or mottos, but they influence the entire organization. So there are many examples that I can talk about, and I think the most uh, famous one are that in recent years there was a concern uh, about the algorithm that recognized uh, the um, 
uh, the, the face of people because it was failing on uh, was failing on people of color or with that skill, and was find out that the algorithm was not trained enough on those minorities. And another example, we have found out that um, some uh, um, the trackers uh, are the health trackers uh, are less effective on uh, women and people of color. So. This lack of the diversity in the tech industry had lead to uh, less problem solving and less innovation. And this is not a problem from the tech itself, for the tech industry itself, but it's a problem, it became a problem from the whole society. Implicit bias are natural of the human behavior and we all have them, we all have them. Uh, the important is to interrupt, but it's not about blaming people, but rather working together to create a more inclusive and diverse tech industry. So yeah, I, I should already convince you that uh, is important, but exclusion is not a, a low priority or a nice to have, it's a must. And, um, the, the comf and if it's not enough, uh, or even the profitability of the company will benefit from having a diverse team uh, because it brings innovation and help to better understand the client from different perspective. So we have to fix this problem as soon as possible because discriminating people is just wrong and is not acceptable any anymore to continue to perpetuate these behaviors in 2023. Um, I want to give you an example, uh, if you're not convinced enough. Um, oh, what happened? Okay. Um, this is Diana Tamina. She is a brilliant mathematician and his skills helped to solve the, a question that was going on for centuries, uh, how to draw the hyperbolic plane. And this is an example how the combining the skill will help, uh, will end up in the innovation. Mathematician could not solve this problem for a century. And this sure reminds us that innovation many times came out from mixing the different skin perspective uh, and experience and disciplines. So Houston, we have a problem. How, when, how can we fix in practice? First, start from the job description. Words that are considered more masculine. Women tend to believe that I don't belong to this position and find the job less appealing. So develop a job advertisement that uh, uh, is with, without uh, masculine gender words. For example, competitive, assertive, ambitious, and track if these good lines are followed. Um, some researchers have shown that uh, women are less likely to apply to a job if they don't meet 100% of the qualification. Instead, men, uh, they will apply even if they only meet some of the qualification. And this can contribute to gender gap in the application pool. Um, to address this, um, we should consider to review our long, nice to have list of qualification and keep only that are meaningful and important for the job because that can discourage some good talent woman to apply. It. And this is a little reel that I found very funny on Instagram. And uh, nope, wrong button. Five years experience with Excel. I only have four years and three months. Well, I heard of Excel 10 years ago. So that's basically 10 years experience. Attention to detail. I did make a typo last year. I always know when my mom moves my stuff. Great communicator. I've been working on my communication issues in therapy. Yeah, I talk good. Works well with others. They're gonna find out I had a friendship ruined over a project in fifth grade. Others love me. Startup environment. Ugh, I hate playing ping pong. Startups, no HR. 
Yeah, that is exactly the problem. <laughs> okay. And then the hiring process, start giving managers um, blind resume, so remove all the personal detail of the uh, applicant, uh, name, gender, date of birth, picture, all this stuff, and track if this changes, change the hiring number. Use a structured interview process and define some set of questions to ask to all the candidates to assure more fairness and consistency and uh, provide unconscious by training to hiring manager regularly. Encourage STEM education uh, for young girls uh, is very, very important to increase women participation in tech and in enforce that there is there is more than one way to be interested in computer science. We don't have to be obsessed with the computer. We don't have to conform to the boy hacker stereotype to be good and appreciate the field. Representation, our role model and mentors play a crucial role in inspiring us and guiding people in their life and their career. And uh, one of the keynote of Python Italia had an entire talk of the power, about the power of representation, and here there is the link of Marlene's talk, and if you're interested in the topic, put in your watch later YouTube list. Mentorship program are a beautiful example how to increase women participation, so define some position that uh, don't require an experience before. And for example, at Toshbo, we have the Toshbo Academy, when we take junior developer without experience, or there is uh, Google, Google Summer of Code, for example. Um, this allow people who want, for example, to switch career also to, to start, and it's a good way to find new talent. So preaching the diversity is not enough. We have to create a safe and supportive work environment where everyone, regarding their background or identity, feel valued and included and heard. To achieve this, we need to build a culture of open communication and feedbacks. Everyone should feel comfortable speaking up, bringing new ideas, uh, and or report issues when they happen without the fear of backslash. Ensure there are procedures in place to report when something bad happens. It's not enough to li just listen. We must also to act. Uh, so when issues like uh, harassment happen or discrimination occur, we should not look on the other way just because the people involved are strategic in the organization, but instead we have to have like procedure in place, talk with HR and uh, to address this problem, do the training and be sure that it doesn't happen again. So an inclusive workplace is more than just a diverse workplace is a place where everyone feels safe, heard, and respected. And when we build such a workplace, uh, we foster a better, better idea and uh, a stronger environment. And I talk about uh, workplace culture uh, in, at PyCon Italia. It's another 30-minute talk, and I have only two minutes left. So if you are interested in continuing with this topic, love, this is the video, and we will upload soon, uh, this is the streaming, uh, and uh, Marco over there will upload the video uh, later, but we are enjoying the conference, so we didn't have too much time to split in them, but they will be there soon. Um, uh, resource, some resources that I use it um, while I was researching for this topic, and other resources. And that's what it was it. The slides are available on Discord uh, and on my website, on this link. Thank you. We will now have five minutes of Q&A. Please use the microphones to ask questions. Yeah, my first question is, somebody has a thing to open the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah.
Next question. <laughs> Hi, thank you for the talk. I just want to ask you a bit more about the Torchbox Academy program that you mentioned. Yeah. And how do you select people for that to ensure that you're not just taking those with the most advantage already who apply, who perhaps can present their applications a bit better and things like that? Um, I'm not involved uh, in the organization of the program uh, because I've been there only for five months. Uh, there is a, a day where we bring uh, all the application at the office uh, and they will do workshops, uh, uh, we will do some talks uh, as well, uh, we will tell them the whole thing and then they will do a task, uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, and then we will evaluate based on, on, on them performance, basically. So you bring everyone who applies yeah. into the office first? Yeah, that's really good. Thank you very much for the talk as well. Hello. Thank you so much for the talk. That was pretty interesting and pretty much confirmed what I have been talking about since university with assumptions. One point is something I noticed from since I started programming in school with like 15 and I'm trying to apply to university, to jobs, and now as an adult, applying to jobs is one expectation that I meet explicitly and implicitly all the time is, did you have some private projects? What did you do in your private projects? Are you always reading these tech magazines? And I sit there and think, oh, sorry, that's my free time. Do you have, and, I, and, and yes, sometimes I do, but even then what I do has nothing to do with what I do in work. Like I love embedded systems, and that's what I do in private time, and I'm a Python developer in the back end. So, do you have a cha an idea how to raise awareness in the people hiring and being the team leads that while that is a cool thing to have and to do, it has nothing to do if the person will be a good programmer for you, especially not in the very beginning when you're hiring juniors from university? Yeah. Um Okay, the question was really long. Can you say? Um, do you have a chance how to raise awareness for the fact that um, this exists and it doesn't mean the person is a worse programmer, it just means yeah. it's not their hobby? Yeah, yes. I, I think when company want to look here and see some side project, if you have it, that's it's fine, but they, they should offer a, an alternative uh, and can doesn't have to be some some code uh, specifically. Uh, maybe just talk about your passion, but it's not about the job. So I'm, I agree to you that doesn't matter. Uh, I, I would like that them will understand that it doesn't matter. <laughs> and it's kind of a challenge. I hope that you will watch my video. Hi. Um, when talking about gender bias in tech, in work, I've had previous issues where people maybe don't understand, like at a fundamental level, like the gender pay gap, mm -hmm. or like alternatively, like anecdotal evidence of saying, oh, well, I've never had an issue uh, being a woman in tech, so, yeah. Um, so how would you recommend talking about those issues in an informal way in work, especially mm -hmm. without mansplaining? Huh. <laughs> It's a tricky way because when someone has a strong belief, it's hard to convince that actually the reality is is, is not in that way. It, because if you don't, if it didn't happen to you, it doesn't matter. It's not true that it's not happening. And maybe ping the, the bring the topic from time to time. Um, hey, look at this cool um, uh, article or something, or um, sometimes it's even in the news. Uh, I, I mean, uh, recently uh, in Italy there was kind of uh, an harassment uh, issue in the agency. So if, if you know something that is happening, it can be a good way to start the conversation. Look, this is real, and, and start from there. Thank you, Esther. Unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions here, but please talk to Esther after the talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, uh, folks from this room.
Thank you.